I'd like to introduce uh, John Bloom, who is the director of the Master of Arts in Science and Religion program. John Bloom is uh, a dual PhD. Uh, we like to call him one of the smartest guys on campus, having more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, and I'd like to bring him up. His PhDs are in physics from Cornell and um, in ancient Near Eastern studies from the Annenberg Research Institute. One little fun fact about tonight's event, if you haven't noticed, there are three physicists on the table here. They've all got PhDs in uh, physics, so uh, hopefully that will engage the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you for braving. Um, these are called blizzards in Southern California, <laughs> what it's doing outside there. I was raised in Wisconsin, and we never batted an eye when it was raining, but around here, I learned that when it rains, it's as bad as a foot of snow or more uh, in my hometown. So glad you've made it tonight. Since the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859, Christians have been divided over how much, if any, of Darwin's theory to accept and how to reconcile his theory with the traditional understanding of the Genesis creation account. In his later book, Descent of Man, Darwin presented an evolutionary model for human origins, which gave mankind a profoundly different role, purpose, and significance in the universe than that offered by traditional Christian views. Once again, Christians have been divided over how much, if any, of Darwin's theory to accept and how to reconcile it with a Christian worldview. This evening, we're privileged to have two scholars who will present significantly different ways to reconcile Darwinism and Christianity. Carl Geiberson has earned his Ph.D. in physics from Rice University. This is a professor at Eastern Nazarene College where he teaches interdisciplinary seminars in the history of science. He's also the director of the Forum on Faith and Science at Gordon College and co-director of the Venice Summer School on Science and Religion. For many years, he was the editor of Science and Theology News, which helped earn him international recognition. 2006, he lectured at the, at the Vatican on America's ongoing hostility to Darwinism. His primary research focus is the history and sociology of the creation evolution controversy. In 2007, he co authored Oracles of Science Celebrity, Celebrity Scientists versus God and Religion, where he examines the purported abuse of science in the, surface, in the service of secularism by the six most influential scientists of this generation, including Carl Sagan and Richard Dawkins. In 2008, he published Saving Darwin, How to Be a Christian and Believe in Evolution, which will be the subject of the dialogue this evening. John West earned a PhD in government from Claremont Graduate University and is a senior fellow at the Seattle-based Discovery Institute, where he is Associate Director of Discovery Center for Science and Culture and Vice President for Public Policy and Legal Affairs. Previously, he served as an Associate Professor of Political Science at Seattle Pacific University, where he chaired the Political Science Department. He's also served as a managing editor of Public Research Syndicated, which distributed essays on public affairs to more than 700 daily and weekly newspapers. In 2006, he published Darwin's Conservatives, The Misguided Quest. And in 2007, he published Darwin Day in America, How Our Politics and Culture Have Been Dehumanized in the Name of Science. These books focus on how the materialistic worldview of Darwinism has impacted a wide range of fields. The format for the dialogue this evening will be as follows. Dr. Geiberson will speak for 30 minutes, followed by Dr. West for 30 minutes. Then Dr. Geiberson will respond to Dr. West's remarks for 10 minutes. And then Dr. West will respond to Dr. Geiberson's remarks for 10 minutes. Following that, there will be a five-minute time for uh, Carl, I'll just go to first names here, for, for Carl to question John, and then five minutes for John to question Carl. At that point, then, we will open it up to questions from the audience to either or both speakers. So I'm really looking forward to the dialogue this evening, and I don't think that in one session we'll be able to reconcile issues that have been troubling us for over a century, but certainly I look forward to this being a time of great enlightenment and a current update on some of the problems and issues that we face. Carl. Start here. Thank you. 
I'm very glad to be out here, and uh, despite the fact that uh, you guys are having a blizzard out here, it's nothing remotely like the blizzard that uh, my wife is enduring uh, back in Boston. Uh, so I still thank you for the weather despite the uh, rain tonight. Just really glad uh, to be here, and it's great to see uh, John again. Uh, John and I spent a delightful three summers uh, at Wycliffe Hall in uh, Oxford in a Templeton Science and Religion program. and got to know each other there, and he was working on this master's program that uh, he subsequently inaugurated here, and we had a lot of opportunities to chat about uh, some of these topics. Uh, but as I have only 30 minutes, and I'm instructed by my uh, program here to start, uh, let me uh, get going. Uh, I'm calling uh, my project tonight uh, the BioLogos uh, proposal. Uh, BioLogos is an ugly word that Francis Collins has coined. Uh, but if you're the head of the Genome Project, you get to make up words. Uh, and uh, Collins coined this term because the word evolution is uh, so loaded now that he would like us to be able to discuss this topic without having all of the baggage associated with it. Uh, Howard Van Til spent the better part of a career trying to find a different term for, uh, for evolution. He was not uh, successful. Uh, he felt that the phrase theistic evolution, which is roughly what I'm supposed to defend here tonight, suffered from what he called a stench by proximity. Uh, that, that even though the word theistic is a nice word for Christians, since we're all theists, the word evolution smells so bad that when you pull theistic up beside it, uh, it still just smells bad. Uh, so uh, if you will, uh, try not to uh, inhale too deeply when you see the word evolution up here and get, uh, and get a bad smell. Uh, so let me tell you just very quickly what I want to do, and then, uh, and then I will do that. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the fact that, that evolution does indeed have uh, evidentiary support. Now, as I'm sure that we'll get into tonight, uh, evidence doesn't interpret itself. Uh, it needs uh, theories and frameworks, but uh, evolution does have uh, evidence, and we need to take that on board. I think that evolution has some theological advantages. I think there are certain problems that are mitigated a bit uh, by uh, evolution. And I also think that certain of the the theological problems which are raised by evolution have solutions. I think there are ways to look at some of those problems that I'm sure we will get into tonight uh, and see uh, a way to navigate uh, out without losing anything that is uh, central to our uh, Christian beliefs. So uh, that's what I want to do uh, just very quickly uh, tonight. A standard treatment of the uh, evidence for evolution usually points to several different uh, categories or lines of evidence that all converge on the same story of natural history uh, pictured here in the familiar uh, tree diagram. Uh, We can look at uh, evidence from fossils. We can look at evidence from biogeography, both the present distribution of uh, animals and plants and the historical distribution. We can look at evidence from genetics, from comparative anatomy, and from development. Uh, And in all of these uh, different and unrelated areas, we can see uh, pointers towards a theory of evolution, much like what Darwin proposed uh, 150 years ago. Uh, We call this uh, consilience. It represents a certain very powerful type of argument when independent lines of evidence uh, converge on the same conclusion. Uh, So I want to just very, very briefly uh, mention each one of those so that you can just get a sense for how much of the... uh, field of biology uh, has evidence which is flowing into this uh, argument. Uh, As you've uh, probably seen uh, in uh, some of your textbooks, evolution has a a branching structure. Uh, The branching structure that allows so much of the natural world to be organized makes a lot of sense within the framework of evolution. It's hard to make uh, sense of it otherwise. At a very large scale, this familiar distribution can be laid out here and Uh, Common ancestry uh, helps us to understand that. Uh, And at a very small scale, we can do exactly the same thing. Uh, The fact that these branches with common ancestors for proliferating species appear at every level of uh, complexity in nature uh, is a suggestion that common ancestry is indeed a, a fact of natural history. The fossil record... Uh, was one of the first places where some of the interesting questions about origins were was discovered when uh, bones of extinct uh, animals were uncovered uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. People began to puzzle over what these could mean. Uh, we now have uh, a lot of fossils, not as many as we need to tell 
a uh, absolutely unambiguous story, but the fossil record shows very clearly that as we uh, move from older strata to newer strata, we progress from simple to complex. Now, there are many things which are not understood uh, in that process, and there are puzzles like the Cambrian explosion, which uh, people debate about, but it is definitely the case that there is a progression Uh, And to take one simple example, uh, there are absolutely no mammals in the oldest layers, none at all. Uh, There are no human fossils uh, until the most recent layers. And this is an an ordered sequence, a rather large amount of data, which fits into this pattern of common ancestry uh, suggestive of evolution. Biogeographically, there are two ways to look at this. One is the historical argument. Uh, If we Create, recreate the fossil record on the continents. What we see uh, is that uh, in the uh, in the particular case of the boundary here between uh, South America and Africa, that we find exactly the same fossils in the fossil record until about uh, 150 million years or so ago, when the split occurs. They separate like this, and then we find diverging and independent uh, fossils there. Now, it, it's hard to understand why we would have that pattern. Uh, there uh, if it was not the case that we had this sort of uh, steady uh, common ancestry proliferating on both sides of this divide until the divide uh, splits there. Uh, In the same way, we can look at the current distribution of uh, animals today uh, and we can note uh, very common sense observations of the sort that Darwin made on the beagle and that any uh, field biologist makes today, and, and that is that uh, species which are uh, on islands near the mainland, for example, the uh, species which are on islands which are very close to the mainland are most similar. The ones which are on islands further away are the most different. Uh, why does this pattern exist? Uh, and Uh, In many cases, these islands are more or less indistinguishable from each other, and this was one of the things that puzzled Darwin, and I think it's answerable with with evolution, Uh, but if all of these uh, animals are placed on these islands by uh, by God, as Darwin had uh, initially thought, uh, why would there be different uh, animals on more or less identical uh, islands? So he so he wrestled with that, uh, and he noted in particular, very famous example, that uh, that the natives of the Galapagos could tell which of the islands a particular turtle came from simply by looking at the markings on its uh, shell. So there was very clearly something going on that gave a unique uh, flora and fauna to each one of these. In uh, the argument from comparative anatomy, uh, which was an, uh, an argument that developed largely uh, out of uh, curiosity initially, uh, wondering what the similar shapes of animals meant, uh, we see uh, sequences like uh, this one here, uh, and uh, Ambulocetus in particular was an intermediate uh, fossil that was discovered between what's clearly a land animal and a sea creature uh, here. Uh, this was uh, predicted by... Uh, the evolutionary theory and fossils were uh, uncovered in a location that was uh, suggested by the theory. Uh, and uh, in all of these other examples here, we can see that so we can see what looks like historical modification of body plans uh, in a way that is suggestive again of uh, of common uh, ancestry. Uh, an example which is very uh, familiar to us, since this is our hand over here on the uh, right, uh, we all have uh, five fingers, and it turns out that we see this same uh, sort of five-fingered appendage uh, in a whole set of different uh, organisms. Uh, in the case of the bat, they are stretched out, they're elongated, they're very light, and a webbing is stretched over them because they're being used for flight. Uh, cats and whales use theirs in different ways, but in all cases we have the same pattern of five. Uh, there is no, nothing special about five. It doesn't appear to be optimal in any particular way. So the fact that all of these different animals have uh, five uh, appendages at, at the end of their arms uh, is very, very suggestive of common ancestry. Hard to make sense of why that would be if there's not a relationship uh, between them in that way. Uh, at the level of the gene where... New information is constantly being turned up. Uh, It turns out uh, that we share uh, genes with a lot of other uh, 
uh, organisms, and uh, I think we're probably all familiar uh, with that. Uh, and that admits of different interpretations. Uh, but what I don't think admits of different interpretations is the fact that we share broken genes or what are called pseudogenes with other species. A, a pseudogene is a, a, a dysfunctional, broken gene. Uh, they're uh, very, uh, very rare, and uh, we have certain pseudogenes and it doesn't matter that we have them because sitting right beside them is a functioning gene. Uh, so they're not selected away by natural selection. They don't create any problem for us. Uh, but we have the same pseudogenes as uh, other related species. Now, it's very hard to figure out how it is that we would have the same pseudogene as another species unless we inherited it from a common ancestor. Uh, evangelical biologist Daryl Falk uh, says that, that the pseudogene argument establishes uh, common ancestry as a fact, and if we, and if we do not accept that uh, the pseudogene argument creates uh, a fact out of common ancestry, then there's, then there's no such thing as a biological uh, fact, because this argument is, uh, is so compelling. Uh, Francis Collins, who's uh, been doing uh, a lot of work until very recently in genomes, uh, is, finds the evidence absolutely compelling that's emerging now that uh, we share uh, common ancestry with a lot of other uh, species, and uh, we can now uh, construct much of this uh, common ancestry based on very recent uh, developments. Uh, our DNA, very, very similar to that of, uh, of, of chimps, uh, it's hard to understand why we would be as similar as this if, uh, uh, if there wasn't some uh, important biological relationship there. Uh, and in fact, we have one less chromosome than the chimps, and this was a little bit of a mystery, but uh, a prediction from genetics was, was derived that perhaps in the human genome somewhere there's a fused chromosome where two have stuck together. Uh, and so geneticists went looking for that, and sure enough, they found the fused chromosome just as the theory uh, predicted. So we can see exactly where the mutations are that separated us from, uh, from the chimps. Uh, so the more we learn about uh, chimps and bonobos, the more similar they seem to us. There's an argument from uh, development uh, here. Uh, we have certain things in our... Uh, genes that, uh, that are programming instructions for, for example, uh, webbed uh, fingers and webbed feet. Uh, why do we have genes that program us to have uh, webbed feet? Uh, the way development works in, uh, in the human womb uh, is that uh, we go through a period where this webbing is in place and then the webbing is undone. Uh, if the genetic instructions for undoing this webbing uh, don't work, then a baby can be born with webbing like this, and uh, this will have to be surgically uh, corrected. Uh, so it's hard to understand why we would have the capacity to produce webbing when it doesn't seem to be uh, of any value to us in our uh, ad adult uh, form. And uh, embryos of very, very different species uh, have surprising similarities as they pass through uh, their developmental phases. Again, this is just uh, suggestive, but it, it does hint at the fact that there may be some sort of uh, common patterns that have been used and adapted throughout history to make sense uh, of all of this. Now, uh, I'm sure that uh, an audience like this is aware that every single uh, thing that I've mentioned here uh, has counter-arguments and problems with these. Uh, there's interpretations involved and so on, uh, but this does represent evidence, and it's not the case that there's no evidence or maybe uh, alternative interpretations of this, uh, but certainly we have a lot of evidence in these categories here. But uh, as Christians, we're not concerned only about uh, the evidence. Uh, we want to also uh, ask the question, what's the theological significance of this? Because uh, if the uh, evidence uh, perhaps is compelling, but it's completely incompatible with our belief in God, then uh, perhaps we may reject it anyway. Uh, so let's look briefly at the uh, theological issues. Uh, and I want to uh, suggest that if we think of evolution, as many biologists do today, as being a very uh, creative force able to uh, introduce novelty into nature through mutation uh, and then optimize it to different environments, then we have a way out of some of the complicated uh, theological problems raised by uh, both uh, bad design in nature and what looks like uh, sinister design. 
So let me give you an example that bothered Darwin, uh, that of the Ichneumonidae. Uh, Darwin was repulsed by this and wrote in a letter to one of his friends that he didn't couldn't imagine how God would have created a creature like this. Uh, This is the uh, mother uh, wasp. Uh, She lays her eggs inside a caterpillar, inserting them through a long tube like this uh, inside a tree. This is a marvelous place to lay eggs, extremely well protected from predators, nice, cozy, warm environment inside the host larva. The little babies uh, hatch inside, and they come out, and then they are uh, programmed with an instinct to consume the uh, larva from inside. Their instinct tells them to consume the internal organs in exactly the right order to keep the host larvae alive for the longest possible time. Uh, So uh, in the case of a human parasite doing this, uh, if a human parasite uh, nibbled indiscriminately at your internal organs and happened to choose your heart first, well, you would die immediately and you wouldn't be a congenial host anymore. But if the parasite was smart enough to eat uh, one lung, noticing that there was two, one kidney, noticing that there's two, knowing the spleen uh, was irrelevant in the appendix and so on, and eating them in that particular order, saving the heart uh, and so on for last, uh, then you could live for a rather long time. Uh, This is gross and disgusting and uh, quite similar to a lot of uh, science fiction uh, movies. Uh, So uh, this is an example of a a very sophisticated and uh, intelligent kind of design, but it's kind of horrible. Right? And this is not the kind of uh, sort of irreducible complexity that Michael Behe wants to write about because we're not quite so uh, delighted to think that uh, this uh, is indeed the clever handiwork of an intelligent uh, designer. Uh, closer to home and more familiar is the problem of the way that cats uh, deal with mice. Cats torture mice uh, before they kill them uh, and eat them. Uh, this is quite delightful when we see the little kitten playing on the kitchen floor with the ball of yarn. But outside, where the kitten's mommy is getting supper, uh, it's not delightful at all, especially for the mouse. Uh, The cat grabs the mouse, throws it in the air, beats it around the head. It's it's like some parody of the uh, Sopranos uh, here. Uh, And why does the cat do this? Like, what is the purpose of this? If if we were to uh, go to the butcher shop and we discovered that the way the butcher makes hamburger is that he gets all of his friends to come over with baseball bats and they beat the cow for a little while, having a great time, and then they make hamburger, like, we would be horrified by this. Uh, well, Darwin was kind of horrified looking at this and thinking, I, I, I really don't want to imagine that God created cats with an instinct to behave like this. I, I want another mechanism that could account for this kind of behavior. Very close to home, uh, so close to home that uh, some 3,000 people every year actually die from this problem. Uh, We have not the problem of cruelty in nature, but the problem of uh, what looks like uh, poor engineering design. Uh, We have uh, a complicated valve here called the epiglottis that's supposed to keep food out of our air tube, uh, and some 3,000 people or so die every year uh, because uh, something goes down the wrong hole and you can't get it out. There's an op-ed in the New York Times uh, two days ago about this suggesting that all chefs everywhere to get a chef's license ought to know the Heimlich maneuver uh, so they can uh, rescue people that are choking on their food. Uh, this, this is not the, the way that engineers would put all this together. This, this smacks of having been uh, cobbled together from pre-existing designs rather than having been uh, invented from scratch. Uh, Imagine, if you will, by analogy, that an automotive engineer was doing the same thing, that uh, instead of putting all of the fluids uh, in the automobile uh, in completely uh, separate places, they had one uh, orifice with a complicated system of valves that, if it worked just right, would send the uh, antifreeze to the radiator, the gas to the gas tank, the oil to the oil pan, and so on. Uh, But if any of these valves uh, happened to stick, then... Uh, the car would break down and need costly repairs. I mean, this would be a very, very bad design. We wouldn't design it that way. Uh, so we have to deal with the fact that we happen to be designed that way and ask ourselves, what is the origin of that particular design? So uh, these are our uh, theological challenges, I think, that we have to lay at at the feet of uh, the standard creation picture. And we have to say these kinds of things exist in nature. How are we going to account for them? Are we going to attribute what looks like bad design, uh, unnecessary cruelty and so on to God and say for some reason that we don't understand God put these things in nature? Or might we allow that nature has a certain creative power and some of these things like our own free will 
uh, result in uh, consequences that are not so uh, pleasant. Now, uh, there are problems, however, uh, which are created by uh, evolution. So I want to just mention a couple of these. Uh, Tufts University professor uh, Dan Denton has coined the term universal acid to talk about evolution and the way that it, in his mind, dissolves all traditional ideas. Uh, evolution, he says, eats through uh, just about everything and leaves in its wake a revolutionized uh, worldview. Now, as Christians, I think we, we know, certainly, the debates over the past century, that there are an awful lot of uh, things that have been either dissolved uh, or uh, etched beyond recognition, uh, or at least uh, burned uh, by the universal acid of evolution. Uh, the days of creation was one of the uh, first things uh, to go uh, historically. Uh, the historicity of Adam and Eve as historical characters, that is certainly uh, challenged. Uh, the worldwide flood of Noah with all of the animals uh, in the ark. Uh, the fall is problematic in an uh, evolutionary picture. The image of God is difficult to interpret in the evolutionary framework. Uh, and uh, hitting very close to home, second Adam Christology is difficult uh, to deal with in the case of, uh, uh, of an evolutionary story. If you don't have a first Adam, the second Adam becomes a little bit uh, problematic. Now, uh, some of these, I think, uh, are, are not that big a deal, uh, there have been uh, many creative ways to get around the problem of the uh, days of creation. Uh, uh, the worldwide flood has never been a central article of faith and so on. But the image of God in the fall are very central ideas, and we have to deal with those in some way. And I will certainly admit that uh, these are challenges, difficult challenges that have to be met uh, if we want to bring evolution uh, on board in a, in a Christian worldview. So I want to uh, suggest, I, I don't want to say that I've worked this out and, and offer it to you as, as a completed uh, theology here, but I want to suggest that we think about the possibility that the image of God might not be something that just appears suddenly, but rather something that emerges gradually. I want to suggest a heretical idea that perhaps we might think about sharing the image of God with more species than just our own. Uh, in the same way that human characteristics are distributed even among the human race, we all have a varying capacity for, uh, for worship, for kindness. Some people find religious belief easy. Other people struggle with it. Uh, so perhaps in the same way, whatever it is we think of as the image of God, perhaps that can be something which is, which is broader than merely the human race, uh, reaching down perhaps to other species and perhaps existing there in an anticipatory way and then emerging to a special completion in human beings, but not completely absent from the rest of creation. Uh, I think if we enlarge the franchise in that way, uh, we don't have to see this as being a theological problem. In the same way, but perhaps easier to understand, I think we can do exactly the same thing with our fallen natures. There's certainly no uh, question that human beings are uh, pathologically uh, selfish and sinful and, and capable of great uh, cruelty and so on. Uh, and this is what it means to be fallen. But these behaviors in the human species are not missing from other species. They are also present there. And we can watch... Uh, tribes of bonobos and chimpanzees, and we can see all of these things that human beings uh, do, uh, perhaps in a cruder and less articulate way, but we can find them all present there as well. Uh, so uh, perhaps in the same way that we might be inclined to great violence because we have a fallen nature, uh, then perhaps we might think that uh, chimpanzees, which are an extremely violent uh, species, are also uh, in some sense uh, fallen in this way. And so that fallenness then is something which emerges gradually. Most of what evolution does is it tells us that we need to replace sudden, whiz-bang, instantaneous creations with long, drawn-out creations. And so if we uh, will concede that various human characteristics can be drawn out in this particular way, then I think that we can uh, find a way to, to keep the concept of the fall front and central as an important part of what it means to be human but uh, it's something which we, uh, which we share. So uh, let me uh, summarize this uh, a little bit so that we can 
uh, see what we get uh, and what we don't get uh, if we think about this. The evidence suggests that evolution is the way that God chose to create life. Uh, this is the overwhelming consensus of the scientific uh, community. Uh, it is supported by many lines of evidence. It's, it's a very uh, rigorous uh, conclusion, and I think to, to reject it wholesale uh, is to uh, reject so much of contemporary science. So I think that the, the evidence, and there are uh, uh, some creationists like uh, Paul Nelson and, and John Mark Reynolds who, who, will, who agree with me and will say, yes, the evidence does point in this way. Now, they don't feel compelled to follow the evidence and embrace the conclusion, uh, but many people will agree uh, that the evidence does point uh, in this particular direction. The problems which are created by evolution, however, I don't think are new. I don't think any brand new theological challenges emerge out of evolution that do not exist in some form prior to the theory of evolution. We have, for example, what has long been the theological problem of the hiddenness of God. We would love for God to be more more open and clearer. We'd love to somehow not have to need quite so much faith. Uh, People who who have had the experience of losing Uh, their faith, uh, and this includes uh, Charles Darwin, uh, sense that this is a very great loss and something which they would like to prevent, and they cannot. And the reason why they cannot in many cases is because of the hiddenness of God. It's a long, something the Christian tradition has wrestled with. Uh, God is hidden from us as his followers, his children. Uh, God is hidden in the processes of nature uh, as well. So I don't think the fact that we can't see God's finger being poked in and out of the evolutionary process is any different than the hiddenness of God that the church has wrestled with uh, from the time uh, that Job wondered, wondered what was going on with him. Uh, in the same way, the problem of evil is, no, is not a new problem created by evolution. Uh, we, we certainly do have the problem of waste and suffering and, and so on. And uh, we look at that and we say, gee, uh, if this is God's creative process, why does it involve so much uh, suffering? Why is it the way of all life to go uh, extinct? This is the problem of evil. It's the most compelling philosophical argument against the existence of God, but it has been around forever. It's an ancient argument. Uh, it's just recast in a new context by evolution. Uh, so I don't think we have to uh, fret that if we accept evolution, we have this new problem that we need uh, to wrestle with. And finally, I think that the issue of bad design in nature, and there are many things that we could point to. There are a great number of engineering anomalies in the natural world, uh, things that result in, uh, in us having, uh, for example, uh, bad backs, uh, knees that wear out, uh, and so on. There's a whole host of places that we can say uh, these are not optimal engineering arrangements. And in all of these cases, we can come up with a, with a good explanation from evolution for why they are that way. If we evolve from a creature that used to walk on, four, on all fours, then our spines aren't meant to spend all of their time standing up like this. Uh, so as a result, it's very easy to get a sore back. We can easily understand that. Uh, if we uh, don't have an explanation like that, then we just have to wonder, why in the world did God give us bad backs? Uh, these, I think, are mitigated by uh, evolution. Now, if, if you're at all interested in these questions, these challenges uh, here, if you want to explore this, uh, let me uh, take my last sort of minute here and just make a little uh, advertisement for uh, this project that I'm working on with uh, Francis Collins. Uh, Sometime uh, around March, we hope, we're going to launch a website. Uh, There's a page there now that you can go to, and it's one of those pages that says uh, more to come. Uh, But the biologos.org uh, website is going to contain a set of questions related to uh, evolution in a Christian framework, and uh, we've got about 40 or so ready to go. Uh, the, the project is being run by uh, Francis, who's extremely well-known, uh, Daryl Falk, who is a biologist at uh, Point Loma Nazarene University and a very uh, prominent uh, leader in this uh, conversation, uh, and I'm on the team uh, as well. Uh, and so we're, we're hoping to provide resources that will allow uh, Christians that uh, are beginning to feel 
compelled by the evidence that they need to think more seriously about evolution, uh, but want to know how to reconcile this with their faith, uh, this will be uh, a resource. Okay, thank you. Great to be here. I feel right at home with the downpour coming from Seattle. Actually, we've had pretty good weather the past couple weeks after being flooded out <laughs> earlier. 200 years after the birth of Charles Darwin, we're still debating him. And I think there are good scientific reasons for that. Despite all the triumphalist rhetoric we often hear in the news media and elsewhere from supporters of Darwin, Dr. Guyberson, in his book, correctly notes that Darwin's theory encompasses two different but related claims. He spent most of tonight talking only about one of them. The first is the claim that all living things share a common ancestor, what might be called universal common ancestry. And, but the second claim is that the driving mechanism of evolution is a blind process of natural selection and random variations. Both tenets of Darwinism are, in fact, contestable today on the science and not just by people who support intelligent design. Dr. Guyberson in his book asserts that biologists today consider the common ancestry of all of life a fact on par with the sphericity of the earth or its motion around the sun. What then are we to make of this article that appeared in the New Scientist, uh, if I can get there, just a couple of weeks ago? which talks about, was Darwin wrong on the tree of life? I just want to quote briefly from it. For a long time, the Holy Grail was to build a tree of life, says Eric Baptiste, an evolutionary biologist at the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. A few years ago, it looked as though the Grail was within reach. But today, the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Many biologists now argue that the tree concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. We have no evidence at all that the tree of life is a reality, said Baptiste. That bombshell has even persuaded some that our fundamental view of biology needs to change. Now, the people who are making these claims would call themselves evolutionists. That's, in fact, what makes their admissions all the more startling. The very phylogenetic trees that were supposed to decisively prove universal common ancestry, in fact, have done the opposite. They're in tatters. Similarly, The creative power of natural selection, which, in fact, it was interesting to me that in the discussion of all the evidence for evolution, the focus always on common ancestry, but not on really Darwin's unique contribution, which was evolution by natural selection. People had proposed common ancestry before, long periods of evolutionary development. The unique thing that Darwin proposed was that he had a mechanism, this unguided mechanism of selection and random variation. Well, everyone agrees that natural selection does something, But can I explain the big changes in the history of life, like the origin of animal body plans during the Cambrian explosion more than 500 million years ago? That was Darwin's innovative claim, that natural selection could account for the big changes in the history of life. Well, a growing number of people, and again, these are not just supporters of intelligent design, are skeptical, like Lynn Margulis, biologist with the National Academy of Sciences, anti-intelligent design, but in her view... As she says, new mutations don't create new species. They create offspring that are impaired. Or as she says in a book that she co-wrote in 2003, where she criticized the Darwinian claim to explain all of evolution as a popular half-truth whose lack of explicative power is compensated for only by the religious ferocity of its rhetoric. Although random mutations influence the course of evolution, their influence was mainly by loss, alteration, or refinement. One mutation confers resistance to malaria, but also makes happy blood cells into the deficient oxygen carriers of sickle cell anemics. One mutation causes a flighty red-eyed fruit fly to fail to take wing. Never, however, did that one mutation make a wing, a fruit, or a woody stem, or a claw appear. Mutations, in summary, tend to induce sickness, death, or deficiencies. There are many others who raise challenges to the creative power of natural selection, which is at the core of modern Darwinian theory, like protein scientist and molecular biologist Douglas Axe, who is someone whose research that Discovery Institute has helped fund. I say that because it's often put in the media that we don't actually fund people doing any bench science research, and 
Uh, Doug Axe is an example of where we've done that. Now, we often don't talk about it because when we talk about it, these people end up getting thrown out of their labs or end up facing uh, persecution of one sort or another. He's done work published in the Journal of Molecular Biology that studies what it takes to get a functioning protein sequence in, in the particular sequences that he's studying. And out of, it turns out that out of all the possible protein sequences in the ones that he's studying, only one in a trillion, 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 trillion will work. Making it highly suspect in his view that a blind Darwinian process of chance and necessity could actually find that one right uh, combination out of the trillion, 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 trillion combinations that won't work. I think the most pressing questions in the public debate over Darwin right now are, one, is Darwinian evolution really supported by the science? And two, should we have freedom to debate this question? In many places in America, especially American academia, we don't have that freedom right now. Earlier this week, for those of you following the news, you may have heard that actor Ben Stein was successfully pressured to withdraw as commencement speaker at the University of Vermont because of his views on evolution and intelligent design. In fact, even Richard Dawkins apparently sent letters trying to lobby the university president. I think it's highly ironic that it's at an evangelical Christian school like Biola, a school that some in the secular elites probably would consider closed-minded, that you can have an event like this one, featuring two genuinely different views about Darwin's theory. Meanwhile, at many taxpayer-supported institutions, we have one-sided lecture series uncritically praising Darwin and bashing anyone who dares to criticize him. Indeed, at many taxpayer-supported institutions, they invite people like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett to evangelize, not just for Darwinism, but for their view of atheism. Now, having said this, my main focus tonight isn't going to be on science or academic freedom. Dr. Guyberson wrote a book about Darwin and its implications for faith. As a social scientist, not a physicist, uh, my primary area of interest as a scholar is the relationship between ideas and society. And so I'm very interested in the question as to the social, moral, and even theological implications of Darwin. So that's where I'm going to be focusing most of my comments. Obviously, big cultural debate. We've had a whole group of people calling themselves new atheists, like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, who aggressively argue that Darwinism helps prove atheism. And now we have really what might be called a whole group of the new theistic evolutionists, like Ken Miller, Francis Collins, and Carl Guyberson, who argue that Darwin and faith are compatible. Regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, a Christian, a Jew, an atheist, or an agnostic, who is right? Whether you agree with Darwin or not, is his theory actually compatible with faith and specifically the Christian faith, which was the subject of Dr. Guyberson's book? I think to answer that question, we need to go back uh, in history. One of the working assumptions of some theistic evolutionists is that the idea of God as a creator is not all that important to Christian theology. As long as you believe in Christ, nothing else matters. Dr. Guyberson takes this tack to a degree in his book, where on page 10 he insists that creation is a secondary doctrine for Christians. The implication seems to be that it's not all that important. It's interesting to compare what the early church fathers had to say about this. Uh, Irenaeus, in his famous treatise against heresies, says this, It's proper then that I should begin with the first and most important head, that is, what? Christ the Savior? Nope. God, the creator who made the heaven and the earth and all the things that are therein. Similarly, if you go to um, the Nicene Creed, which for the past 1,700 years has been accepted by all three branches of the Christian tradition, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, is similar. It doesn't begin with Christ. It begins with what? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things, visible and invisible. Now, why did the early church make such a big deal about the doctrine of creation? It's because they knew that without the idea of God as creator, the rest of the Christian story makes no sense. Moreover, the early church was facing stiff opposition to the idea of God as creator from the intellectual elites of their time, opposition that really was eerily prescient, I think, of the debates over Darwin and theology in our own time. I think we can see this in the two big intellectual challenges to God as creator that the early church had to confront. The first might be called um, 
the challenge of materialism. The followers of Greek atomists, Democritus and Epicurus, denied the wonders of the natural world, denied that they were actually produced by design. Instead, they claimed that everything we see ultimately came about through a blind and impersonal process, through chance collisions of mindless atoms in motion that weren't really the intended product of those interactions. Responding to the Epicurean denial of any sort of creator or design, the early Christians repeatedly affirmed that nature provides evidence that it was the product of purposeful design. Design was real, and it was observable from empirical evidence and reason. You certainly find this in the letter to the Romans with the Apostle Paul, famous passage that you might know that talks about, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. What's not often recognized uh, is that what Paul wrote really formed one of the key arguments of the early church. And you find this, I, I myself have been reading the early church fathers over the past year and year and a half and have been struck by this. And here I'll just give a couple of examples uh, so you can get an idea. Uh, Theophilus, who is Bishop of Antioch in the second century, says, God cannot indeed be seen by human eyes, but beheld and perceived through his providence and his works. As any person, when he sees a ship on the sea rigged and in sail and making for the harbor, will no doubt infer that there is a pilot in her who is steering her, so we must perceive that God is the governor of the whole universe. Now, when he says that God is known by his works, what was he talking about? Well, he goes on to say in some amount of depth, and I don't have time here for endless quotations, but just want to point out that when he, the works that he thought that we could discern God's creative activity through uh, were examples from the regularities of nature in astronomy, the plant world, the diverse species of animals, and the regularities in the ecosystem. And so he found, thought that design was observable empirically. You didn't need to have the Bible to see that. And again, this you find throughout the early church fathers, and I'm going to skip by Dionysius because uh, of time, but to Lactentius, who sometimes known as the Christian Cicero, was an advisor to Constantine, uh, lived in the 3rd and 4th century, has a really remarkable uh, statement that he makes uh, in building an argument about the detectability of design. For it's more credible that matter was made by God because nothing can be made without mind, intelligence, and design. And he goes on to say, if you've been brought up in a well-built and ornamented house and had never seen a workshop, would you have supposed that that house was not built by man because you did not know how it was built? You would assuredly ask the same question about the house which you now ask about the world. By what hands, with what implements, man had contrived such great works? And especially if you could see large stones, immense blocks, vast columns, the whole work lofty and elevated, would not these things appear to you to exceed the measure of human strength because you would not know that these things were made not so much by strength as by skill and ingenuity? And he goes on to make the argument to uh, sort of intelligent design in nature from that. Now, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that in confronting sort of the materialist of their day, the early church was very clear in claiming that there was design, it was real, and that we could see it. It wasn't something hidden. But there was a second group that the early church was actually concerned about, a second group that also denied that God is creator. And in many ways, this group is more interesting for our purposes tonight, and that group was the Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics considered themselves Christians, but in many ways, the early church fathers were more concerned about their views than the outright materialists. That's because by dressing up their pagan philosophy in the trappings of Christianity, the Gnostics really sowed confusion among uh, traditional Christians or Orthodox Christians. What became known as Gnosticism now is quite complicated, and there are many variations, and certainly in 30 minutes can't do full justice to it. But the key thing I want to communicate is that most of the Gnostics shared a couple of fundamental beliefs that impacted their view of creation. First, they denied that the world was created good. They thought matter was sinful and that the material world was flawed and evil to begin with. That the problem of pain, shall we say, and the problem of evil was something actually built in to uh, creation. 
It was never good to begin with. Second, because the world was evil, they denied that God actually created the world. They wanted to find distance. That was their solution to the problem of evil, to say that God really wasn't responsible. Instead, they thought the world was created by another entity that they usually called the Demiurge. The Demiurge acted on his own and even assumed the place of God as creator. According to um, Hippolytus, has an interesting discussion of their beliefs where he says, For the Demiurge, they say, knows nothing at all, but is, according to them, devoid of understanding and silly and is not conscious of what he's doing. Uh, He himself imagines that he evolves the creation of the world out of himself. Whence he commenced saying, I am God, and beside me there is no other. It's important to stress that the Gnostics were not atheists. They claimed to be Christians, but the early church completely repudiated their effort to distance the creation from God and deny that it was the intentional and good result of God's design. According to Irenaeus, the Gospel of John, in fact, was written in part to counter these teachings of the Gnostics, especially an early Gnostic known as Serinthus. This is something I discovered just in the last month in reading Irenaeus. Serinthus taught that the world was not made by the primary God, but by a certain power far separated from him, and at a distance from that principality who is supreme over the universe and ignorant of him who is above all. It was to counter this view that the first chapter of John insists that all things were made through Christ, who was in fact God himself, not through a secondary force like the Demiurge. Those who say that Christians can dispense with the doctrine of God as creator so long as they affirm Christ run into a problem with John 1. Because according to John 1, if you deny that God was the direct agent responsible for creation, you're also denying Christ. I think in many ways the modern debate over evolution is a replay of the debates over materialism and Gnosticism in the early centuries of the church. On the side of the materialists, the modern materialists, of course, are the atheistic Darwinists. This would include the new atheists. Contrary to what many theistic evolutionists, I think, tried to suggest in the media, the arguments of the new atheists, like Richard Dawkins, are not simply extraneous add-ons to Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is unguided, almost by definition. Unguided, undirected. That, in fact is what made Darwin so annoyed when some of his theistic supporters like Asa Gray continued to insist that God somehow guided things. That was not his theory. Indeed, Darwin explicitly rejected the idea that the random variations on which natural selection acted were somehow intentionally guided. You can see that from the quote there from variations of animals and plants under domestication. Now, it's true that Darwin never described himself as an atheist, perhaps because of his fears of persecution, It's also true that when writing to friendly theists, he tried to soften the sharp edges of his theory. But it's also just as true that in his private writings and to his writings of his more aggressive supporters who were anti-religious, that it became clear that he did abandon his faith in Christianity and really any belief in a God who plans or directs the development of life. And also that he saw this abandonment of Christianity as being an implication of his scientific views. Natural selection is a designer substitute. Darwin framed his theory specifically as a refutation of the idea of intentional design. Darwin also thought his theory, by the way, had implications for how we understand race, morality, sex, and even welfare policy. Those who claim that there's some sort of firewall between Darwinian evolution and its implications for society and morality and religion are disagreeing not only with much of the evolutionary community today, but with Darwin himself. After all, Darwin wrote an entire book applying his theory to human morality and society the descent of man, where he said a lot of provocative things. One of the things I have to say that frankly amazed me about Dr. Guyberson's book is that he could write an entire section distancing Darwin's theory from social Darwinism without mentioning once Darwin's own book, The Descent of Man. Now, I used to think that Darwin wasn't really connected to social Darwinism. That was sort of an unfair extrapolation. But that was before I actually read Darwin and read The Descent of Man where Darwin uses his theory to offer a scientific defense of racism. Yes, he was an abolite. He he opposed slavery, but he also used his theory to defend uh, a sort of scientific justification for racism, where he argues that reproductive success is the ultimate grounding for all morality. And where he laments that we are destroying the human race by helping the poor, caring for the sick, and inoculating people against smallpox. 
The point I'm making here, it wasn't just other people who thought unguided evolution had implications. It was Darwin himself. Now, maybe Darwin was wrong. Maybe Darwin was the Dawkins of his day. My point here is it's too easy to say that there's no connection when if you actually read Darwin, uh, in fact, the connections are much more dramatic than you might think in his own self-understanding of what his theory meant. Perhaps that's why atheistic and agnostic Darwinists are the mainstream in evolutionary biology today, not the fringe. Now, you would know that, again, from some of the news coverage, which focuses on, say, Francis Collins or, or Ken Miller's. Um, or, you know, part of this is due to a clever PR campaign by self-described evolution evangelist Eugenie Scott at the National Center for Science Education up the state in uh, Oakland, who has a whole strategy to try to convince people that Darwinism is faith-friendly and that there are lots and lots of evolutionary scientists who are Christians. Of course, she herself is an atheist who signed something called a Humanist Manifesto Three that cites unguided evolutionary change as part of its case for a philosophy of life without supernaturalism. So to put it mildly, there's a bit of a disconnect between her public assurances to the faith community and her own actual beliefs about the connections. Now, the empirical data clearly suggests that mainstream evolutionary biology is largely dominated by those who reject traditional religion, far more so than any other scientific discipline. And there's a survey in 1998 by Ed Larson of scientists at the National Academy of Sciences, which showed, very interestingly, that among biologists, the most elite biologists in the nation, National Academy of Sciences, some 65% described themselves as atheists, 29% as agnostics, and you know, the rest were the tiny uh, minority. So that's basically almost 95% of National Academy of Sciences, biologists describe themselves as atheists or agnostics. Similarly, there was a survey of leading scientists in the field of evolution by Bill Provine at Cornell and a graduate student that shows uh, 87% denied the existence of God, 88% disbelieved in life after death, 90% reject the idea that evolution is directed toward uh, some sort of ultimate purpose. The point I'm trying to make here is that, in fact, um, this is not... The fringe, this is really the core uh, of the evolutionary community. Uh, so much so that you even get to professional meetings and you get songs like this. My bones proclaim a story of incompetent design. My back still hurts, my sign is flogged, my teeth just won't align. If I had drawn the bloopers, I would certainly resign in Okay, that song was premiered not with that little group, but actually with some 300 scientists who stood up at a session of a professional meeting in 2005 with the Geological Society of America to sing that. Now, I think, what does that say about the overall attitude among geologists who support evolution to have 300 scientists at a professional meeting turn it into an anti-religious revival meeting? Now, um, how much time, according to your... Okay, well, I'm going to go by. I also just want to suggest that w even when you look at the people who say they're not like Dawkins, like, say, noted philosopher of science Philip Kitcher at Columbia University, actually ends up saying, you know, Dawkins is too harsh. As what we need to do is convince Christians to become spiritual Christians, which really means rejecting everything that they believe about the life of Jesus or salvation as literally false. And as long as you do that, then, you know, you can smooth over the differences. And he thinks this is a solution. He thinks he's actually being the kinder, gentler approach. And so, um, you know, that sort of really is the uh, mainstream core of what you find in the evolutionary biology uh, supporters. But then we get to the theistic evolution, which I would call really the new Gnosticism, because it really denies two things. And we saw some of this, I think, in Dr. Guyberson's talk, but others were sort of glossed over, but they're in his book. Uh, number one, mainstream theistic evolution denies the original goodness of creation. In the traditional thinking, God created the world and human beings as very good. 
Then things got messed up because human beings freely chose to reject God. That's why we need a savior. The Gnostics explicitly rejected this doctrine of the original goodness of creation. So too do mainstream proponents of theistic evolution. And really, there's a really strong passage on this in Saving Darwin, where Dr. Guyberson talks about, really, selfishness drives the evolutionary process and ends up saying, I mean, he seems to be suggesting, maybe we can flesh this out in the question time, or maybe when he rebuts me, he can say I'm wrong, that really selfishness seems to be built in to begin with. So when he talks about the word that we're fallen, it's really, I'd say, an abuse of the word because he doesn't really believe in a fall. A fall suggests that you're fallen from some other state where you were, where you were morally good. And, but in his book, he makes clear that he rejects that, or at least I, it seems to be the case, and uh, maybe he can clarify that. This really makes hash of the Christian idea of salvation. If human beings were sinful to begin with, what is Christ saving us from? God's original botched job? I think no matter how this tries to be dressed up, basically Christians are being urged to reject the basic Christian message of salvation as it's been understood not by fundamentalists or evangelicals, but by Protestant, Catholics, and Orthodox over the past two millennia. And prominent evolutionists who are former Christians, by the way, seem to understand this. There was an interesting uh, interview this week that appeared with Ron Numbers, former former Christian who lost his faith because of Darwinian evolution uh, by his own self-description. He's a historian of science at University of Wisconsin, where he actually talked about that uh, in, you know, in the traditional Christian idea, we humans were perfect because we were created in the image of God. Then there was the fall. So then we have Jesus in the New Testament who promises redemption. I'm quoting from Numbers. Evolution completely flips that. With evolution, you don't start out with anything perfect. There's no perfect state from which to fall. This makes the whole plan of salvation silly because there never was any fall. And I think that does pose an issue. But second of all, you have, and maybe even more basically, you have mainstream theistic evolutionists who deny that nature is the result of God's specific intentions and directions. In traditional Christian theology, God is omnipotent, uh, and he's omniscient, and he's sovereign. He knew what he was doing. And and however metaphorical your reading of Genesis 1 is, and I don't treat Genesis 1 or 2 as a science textbook. I don't consider myself a fundamentalist. I don't consider myself a literalist. However, however you read it, um, the standard teaching, Protestant Catholic Orthodox, has been that God knew what he was doing and that creation really does display his specific intentionality. And he wasn't acting blindly. But really, we get in mainstream theistic evolution the denial of this from Anglican John Polkinghorne, who has some many good things to say, but also when he comes to evolution, he talks about a universe that's understood as creation allowed to make itself, or the world is allowed to create itself or make itself. That's a very different view of creation than the historic Christian picture. It's much closer to Gnosticism than it is historic Christianity. Or you get former Vatican astronomer George Coyne, who says specifically that uh, not even God could know with certainty that human life would come to be. According to mainstream theistic evolution, even God doesn't know how evolution will turn out. That's also really Ken Miller's view, although he sometimes talks out of both sides of his mouth on this. In Finding Darwin's God, he specifically says that he agrees with Stephen Jay Gould that mankind's appearance on this planet was not preordained, that we are here as an afterthought, a minor detail, a happenstance in a history that might just as well have left us out. Now, he does go on to say that God knew that the undirected process of evolution was so wonderful it would create something capable of praising him. But what it was, God didn't really know. So, so just how much did God not know? How different could it be? I pressed Ken in, uh, on a panel in uh, 2007, and so he said, yes, if evolution replayed, we replayed the history of evolution like a videotape, it could have produced a big brain dinosaur instead of us, or even a mollusk with exceptional mental capabilities rather than human beings. I would be interested to know if Dr. Guyberson agrees with this or not. Is that when talking about that God doesn't in his book, that God isn't responsible for the details, are human beings versus big brain dinosaurs, is that uh, the idea, is that a detail? Now, I think that Dr. Guyberson has written a very important book. Um, the time is going down, but I think that 
you know, you have to be clear about the things that he's asking Christians to leave behind. You have to abandon the idea that design is detectable, which was clearly taught not only by the Apostle Paul, but also by the early church fathers. You have to reject the idea that the creation reflects specific directions and intentions of God. You have to reject the original goodness of creation. You have to get rid of the fall, which, to quote Ron Numbers, makes the whole plan of salvation silly. So what's left? I think that's a question. Now, I'm going to go on because... uh, going to talk about that. In fact, there are many scientists, some of whom you know, some of whom you don't, who are raising tough questions about Darwin. And what I think is most interesting to me is that we are, um, have sort of uh, the idea that we need to embrace Darwin because, you know, that's the consensus view of the scientific community. One of the reasons why I wrote my book, Darwin Day in America, is in fact to point out that the consensus view of the scientific community has often been wrong in history. And so that it's useful to ask tough questions. In fact, there are thoughtful people asking tough questions. And I'd say one of my, um, the, the sad things I think about Dr. Guyberson's book, which I think is eloquent, is that I don't think that he actually engages in some of the more serious arguments being offered out of, say, certainly the intelligent design community. He has a few citations of books really not citing specific pages, and it, it's sort of talking past. But um, I think what's healthy for science, and we'll get into some of these things in the discussion, is uh, really questioning. And uh, I'll leave you with this quote by Giuseppe Cermonti, that Darwinism is the politically correct of science. Uh, Giuseppe Cermonti, I had the privilege of meeting a couple of years ago, is an Italian geneticist, and I think this is something to recognize that it really does uh, implicate some of the debates. So, thank you. If we were having this debate in 1650, what... John West would have just said would be something like this. We cannot have a moving earth. The earth must be sitting at the center of the universe. It must be sitting there because the Bible tells us that it's stationary. It must be sitting there because God's great acts of creation and salvation took place on that body. And how can it just be the third stone from the sun orbiting about some other body? Christianity, he would have argued in 1650, will crash and burn if we displace our home from the center. This was the concern and the anxiety of people who were wrestling with Copernicanism when it came on the scene. The evidence began to become compelling and people were forced to think about it, but it didn't fit with their expectations. It didn't make sense of the world. John Donne has that great uh, poem where he says, uh, it's all in pieces and all coherence is gone now. The new astronomy, he said, casts all in doubt. Science has delivered these revelations to us and whether we like these revelations or not, we have to wrestle with them. And while it might be the case that they make us uncomfortable and while they might entangle our theology in questions that we don't want to consider and while they might create mysteries where before we had clarity, it still remains the case that we have to take into consideration the things which science is establishing as the case. So I don't think it's a compelling argument to say that our neat and tidy theological systems will begin to come apart if we embrace evolution. So much for our humanly constructed neat and tidy theological systems. We may need to rebuild them just as people had to rebuild the Aristotelian theology that crashed and burned after Galileo's revolution was completed. So uh, that's the the general comment that I want to make. But I would like to uh, raise now a few uh, specific uh, objections to uh, some of the things that John said. Uh, I don't understand why we have to have been perfect and then fallen uh, 
in order to be saved. I don't get this at all. It seems to me that no matter how we become sinful, we can still be saved from that sin. Uh, to me, this seems like uh, trying to figure out whether somebody has had strep throat their whole life or whether they just got it. And we wouldn't say that penicillin is not effective just because you were born with strep throat. Uh, it only works on you if you just acquired it uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the point is, however we came to be sinful, we're sinful, and we need salvation. So whether or not there was a perfect period in history or not prior to human beings being sinful, I think is inconsequential for our need for, uh, for our salvation. I'm also a little bit uneasy about John's extensive use of uh, insights from people who lived and died centuries before science was born. It's one of the great, I think, unfortunate uh, contingencies of history that Christianity was fully developed, the canon was closed, the creeds were all chiseled in stone uh, a thousand years before we began to develop modern science. And so we don't know what those things would have looked like if the people that were develop, developing them would have understood science. Uh, he quoted uh, St. Lactantius as an important church father. Well, St. Lactantius happens to be the only Christian that we know of from St. Paul forward who thought that the earth was flat. So if we want to take our cues about how to read design from the natural world from somebody who thought that the earth was flat, uh, then certainly, by all means, let us refer to St. Lactantius. But there's a whole set of profound scientific misunderstandings in the writings of these uh, early church fathers. Uh, Augustine didn't believe that there were people south of the equator for uh, reasons related to biblical interpretations, uh, and a whole host of things like this that we have to wrestle with. What would Christianity look like if science had been born in the centuries before Christ instead of way after? We can't say. That's why we have to wrestle with it, bringing science on board after the fact. The first comment that John made, uh, he was quoting somebody from New Scientist, uh, and certainly I think it's appropriate to raise these questions about dissenters. And certainly the power of any intellectual enterprise comes from its openness to dissent, its willingness to engage uh, people who uh, have alternative viewpoints. But it's important to realize that science is not all about just picking the particular expert that you like and running with their ideas and ignoring the ones that you don't like. Science, like theology, like the Christian church, like many enterprises, is a communal enterprise. And because it's a communal enterprise, there are many, many people who are involved in the discussion. And no matter what the idea, you can always find some dissenter out on the edges who, for good reasons that are compelling to him or her, but not to everybody else, rejects the central tenets of the community of which they are a part. There are always people like that. They are useful because they keep us honest. Once in a while, they turn into Albert Einstein and they revolutionize the scientific community. More often than not, they fade into obscurity, and we've, we never hear from them again. Pons and Fleischmann, maybe some of you know that name, maybe some don't. They were two guys out on the fringe of science who thought they'd figured out a way to get fusion to work at room temperature. They were hopelessly wrong. Now they labor in obscurity in some lab over in the Far East that gave them some money to pursue this crazy idea that fusion can be accomplished at room temperature. There are always people like that. And one of the things which is very misleading, I think, about the way the anti-evolutionary agenda is advanced is that these dissenters are gathered together and they are represented as if they are somehow typical, as if they are sort of part of a big movement uh, of dissent. They are not. Okay? In the most case, they are lone rangers without a lot of, uh, a lot of support in the scientific community. I also have concerns that we need to be careful how much of our discussion we tie to Darwin. Now, Darwin, of course, is the reason why there are so many uh, events like this right now, because this is a, a centennial uh, time. Uh, but contemporary evolutionary theory is not Darwinism. And you can be pretty sure if you hear somebody using the word Darwinism, it's usually somebody who's critical of evolutionary theory. 
you don't read uh, Nature magazine and see evolution referred to as Darwinism. Okay? It's no longer attached to Darwin. It was a theory which developed then. But just as we don't call uh, mechanics Newtonianism today, we don't call quantum theory Planckism, we don't call relativity theory Einsteinism anymore, we don't call evolution Darwinism anymore. Uh, we have to ask, what does evolution mean to the people who are doing it today? It means something very different than what it did uh, in Darwin's day. Darwin was, in many ways, a part of the 19th century. Uh, he shared the racism of his generation, but he was absolutely, incorrigibly hostile to slavery. Uh, there's a new uh, biography by uh, Desmond and Moore that has just come out uh, last week uh, that suggests that, that Darwin was so hostile to slavery that he was determined that his theory would show common ancestry of all the different human races on the planet. There was a theory called polygenesis, which suggested that some of the races which were viewed as inferior and thus uh, separate from uh, the white race uh, and appropriately enslaved, that he, he was appalled by this idea and he wanted to show that they had a common ancestry so that he could uh, create a scientific argument that it was not appropriate for one race uh, to uh, enslave another. There, there are some important considerations here as well that I think relate to philosophy and not to science. Whether or not we want to connect in some intimate way evolution to social Darwinism uh, is, is a philosophical question. Now, most philosophers would say that, that you cannot derive ought from is. That's the shorthand notion. You cannot look at the way the world is and then make some sort of a value judgment about how it ought to be. Now, the way the world is should inform your value judgments, but it cannot dictate them. You have to use something else. So it may be the case that we can look at natural history and see that a process of selection in which the weak were destroyed and the strong survived produced remarkably more sophisticated and successful creatures. This may indeed be the case. But it doesn't follow in any way at all from that, that we should therefore take that process and help it along. When people made these arguments in the past, they were making a philosophically inappropriate extrapolation. You cannot make that philosophical argument that we ought to do this because of the way that part of the world is over there. That's a different kind of argument. And uh, I think just about every philosopher, and I'm sure there are several in this room, uh, would, be, uh, would, would be in agreement on that question. So I, I don't think we can tar Darwin or the theory of evolution with the social applications that have uh, misused it. Um, just a few uh, thoughts. <laughs> Carl starts off by making a very good evolutionary argument. It shows how evolution has sort of tinged our rhetoric to compare that you know, anyone who wants to defend sort of historic truths of the Christian faith, it's equivalent to standing up for believing that the sun revolves around the earth and that you know, we've progressed beyond that. But I think you do need to ask yourself, what is Christianity? Does it have at no core content, no propositional content? The things that I was talking about, I mean, as in my reading of the Bible, I'm not a professional theologian, but in my reading of the Bible, uh, the, uh, the sphericity of the earth or the, you know, whether the earth revolves around the sun or vice versa isn't a key doctrine that I find anywhere in the Bible. Things like the fall, whether God was an active creator to the point that actually he planned and, and that the creation, including human beings, or the result of his purposeful activity as an artist, as a craftsman, as, as someone who lovingly uh, wants, wanted to build something beautiful. Uh, the idea that uh, creation was originally good. These are core doctrines, um, not just in the church fathers, they're in the Bible. They've been accepted by the three Christian traditions. Now, it wasn't I who wrote a book saying Dr. Guyberson's book, the claim of his book, is that basically how a Christian can also you know, support Darwin's theory. My point is that if you end up rejecting the fall, the original goodness of creation, the, 
idea that God actually purposely you know, directed his creation so there's a real creator in the sense that the Christian tradition has actually understood it, um, what you're offering is something different than Christianity. Now, maybe Christianity is wrong. Then let's just be frank about that, and let's try to let's come up with a new religion, and then you can have a debate. But it's really sort of bait and switch to say that you're defending Christianity and then say, well, but Christianity really... Is, doesn't have significant propositional content, we can just change it all in order to reconcile it with evolution. It's interesting that he cites, as one of the key figures here, Howard Van Til. And he cites him in the book as the example of someone who's an orthodox, you know, conservative Christian who's an evolutionist. Well, within the last couple of years, Howard Van Til has now called himself a free thinker. He's further evolved. He's actually no longer a conservative Christian. In fact, it's not clear to me that he's a Christian at all. He calls himself a free thinker. And this position of whether you call it biologos or you know, uh, Christian uh, you know, theistic evolution doesn't seem to be a very solid stopping point. And in fact, I, I, one of the more troubling passages in Dr. Guyberson's book is when pressed, the one place where he seems to give what he thinks are compelling reasons for his faith, he lists, my parents are deeply committed Christians and would be devastated were I to reject my faith. My wife and children believe in God, and we attend church together regularly. Most of my friends are believers. I have a job that I love at a Christian college that would be forced to dismiss me if I were to reject the faith that underpins the missions of the college. What struck me about that was that these were sociological reasons. They weren't about whether Christianity is true. And so I think in some sense, uh, if you're going to make the argument, you can argue that Christianity was wrong and outdated, and we've evolved beyond that. That's That's its own debate. But if you're going to claim that Christianity is consonant with Darwinian theory. Um, I I do think one can't simply say that, well, all these doctrines are wrong, and so we're coming up with our new definition of Christianity. Now, uh, Dr. Guyberson also, uh, in his original comments, made points about bad design, which I wanted to address. Just three quick points. One, the Edsel was not a greatly designed car, but it was designed just want to point out from a scientific standpoint, if you're not looking at theology, the argument of bad design, which Darwinists, who in fact are non-Christians, make all the time, is primarily a theological argument. It's not actually a refutation of design. You can have something poorly designed that in fact is designed. Point two, many of the things that Darwinists have a habit of pointing to as bad design turn out not to be bad design. In fact, they something called, you know, God of the gaps arguments. Well, there's really the Darwin of the gaps argument. If you can't find initial function, Darwinists say that it must be flotsam and jetsam left over from uh, the blind evolutionary process. And it used to be all these vestigial organs, many of which now are regarded as actually having function. The current incarnation which, uh, of this argument is junk DNA, which we got a little bit of this tonight. It's really the linchpin of the argument of of Francis Collins, or one of the linchpins, and of many modern theistic evolutionists. That that junk DNA is just so littered of this repetitive DNA that has no function, like pseudogenes. Well, one of the things I wasn't able to go on, there was actually a Washington Post article from two years ago that actually really gives insight into how this this is a myth. In fact, they're finding that the things called junk DNA are incredibly purposeful. And the things called pseudogenes actually aren't non-functional. They're not garbage. They're not gibberish, as he describes them in his book. And in fact, uh, the Darwinian popularizers really haven't gotten the message. But in the uh, actual peer-reviewed literature, the evolutionists are, are now sort of backing off and saying, well, this shows it's so functional because Darwinian evolution is so great, natural selection is so great and efficient, that of course we'd expect everything to be functional. Of course, for 20, 30 years, they made the opposite argument. One of the great things about evolution, Darwinian evolution, is that no matter what comes up, you can actually square it with it. Now, fi- final point on bad design. This is a theological issue. It does raise some interesting issues. Now, if you're, but if you're going to ask a theological question, then I think rather than go to science, you should also try to get a theological answer. And I'd say the traditional Christian tradition does have theological answers, like the fall. But of course, if you reject the fall and the idea that it had real consequences for nature, then of course you are stuck with the problem. But I think, as in his book, criticizes intelligent design for not having a theology of you know, understanding bad design and how you know, this is theologically problematic. Well, intelligent design, unlike theistic evolution, doesn't actually purport in science to be uh, a theology of creation. Uh, but if you're going to ask a theological question, uh, 
it seems to me that to say that there is no answer, when in fact, really, there is an answer in traditional Christianity, but that's been dismissed as, well, we, that's something we have to reject. So therefore, the problem still uh, remains. Now, um, about the ought and is, I, all I'd just say is in Darwin's view, and in the view of many evolutionary psychologists today, they have a monocausal explanation for why we have any of our moral beliefs, right or wrong, and that is you know, going ultimately to reproductive success. And so in that s- scheme, yes, uh, if there is an independent ought that's independent from the material process that generates it, uh, yes, you ought to be able to criticize things that are in nature. My point is that theoretically, how Darwin set up his theory, he was denying you the grounds to do that. And in Descent of Man, although he came down on saying, oh, nature supports the golden rule, it was with the caveat, because right now it promotes survival. And he has some very disturbing passages in the Descent of Man where he made clear that theoretically, that uh, really, I mean, he was offering a Hobbesian view of nature, that really, uh, you know, the, the one... Uh, thing was physical survival, and that everything, ultimately, morality is instrumental to that. And if that's your monocausal explanation, I don't see how you say that we now stand outside of it to criticize that. Now, you can stand outside it by claiming there are real entities outside of what Darwin allowed, or what the modern Darwin materialists allow. That's true. And so in that respect, I guess maybe we agree that Darwin was wrong there. And so I'm good. So maybe there is some agreement and common ground between theistic evolutionists uh, and I, uh, who reject Darwin's own sort of uh, description, monocausal description of uh, morality. Two minutes. Well, I think um, I will end on that. Okay, now uh, Carl can ask John questions for five minutes here, and hopefully John can answer them, vice versa. Um, Well, I'm I'm, I'm interested in how you think about the creation account. Now, you you said that you're not a biblical literalist and not a fundamentalist, uh, but I wonder whether there's any uh, significant difference between you and the fundamentalists on those scores. I mean, it seems to me that, that what we have in the, in the story in Genesis is a, a beautiful poetic account, a kind of a nice, it's a, like a hymn uh, that's in there with, with a refrain and, and, a, and a Hebrew structure very suggestive of, of poetry. Uh, and it seems to have been something that was part of an oral tradition, easy to memorize and repeated on special or religious days and so on, uh, and it makes these various references to the to the natural world, uh, and so I'm, I'm I'm wondering whether, as you read that account, I mean, do you when you read the the statement that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, I mean, do you do you infer then that the earth uh, appeared at the very beginning, that there's no cosmic history prior to the earth? No, I, mean, I actually think, and again, I'm, I'm not a, a theologian, but in my, um, how I would tend to approach Genesis uh, 1 uh, is not either how young earth biblical creationists would or old earth biblical creationists of seeing that, well, can we either, uh, that it's giving a sequential order of how things had to have developed or that it gives you know, long ages that you know, sort of have to fit in, juxtaposed to the scientific count. I think that for myself that that is a, um, that that's not the purpose. You you have to read. You have to try to read a text with regard to what the original points were. And I don't think trying to give a scientific description was the original point. Having said that, I don't see um, to say something may have been poetic or to say that something um, is not purporting to offer, say, a, a scientific description of something doesn't mean that it's not trying to teach truths. And I don't see how one gets from either Genesis or throughout the whole biblical account, or 2,000 years of theological history of Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, uh, the idea that, the, uh, you know, that God didn't know uh, whether we were going to be big brain dinosaurs or thinking clams, as uh, is in the view of Ken Miller. Or that, you know, that God was not... It seems to me that one of the things that happens again and again of saying that God did something, he saw that it was good, 
is that you're actually getting the idea that God is being viewed as an artist or as a craftsman or someone who lovingly, purposefully created the creation. Not another entity, a demiurge or natural selection acting on random variation that God doesn't really know what's going to do, and so it works creating itself, but that God himself envisioned and that whatever process by which he used, whether it was descent with modification or some other process, it cannot in the Christian tradition, be described as a process that God didn't know what was happening and that it was outside of his uh, really specific and intentional uh, desires for creation. Well, I, the, the question, though, that I have is that, uh, that I, I'm trying to figure out how much science you are going to sort of put in, in the Genesis story. I mean, if, if you're going to say that, that the bad design that we see in nature is a result of the fall and that there wasn't any uh, death and evil and so on before the fall. And so, I mean, this, this would be the viewpoint, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that there's no carnivores, for example, before hu- human beings, and so that uh, we have to somehow then deal with the, the presence of all of these carnivores with ripping, tearing teeth and claws and so on in the fossil record when supposedly they were, were herbivores for you know, hundreds of millions of years before human fossils appear. Yeah, I, I don't know whether, that, um, whether that's true or not. I'd, I'd say other things. One of the beliefs I have, uh, and this maybe comes out of uh, studying political history, um, is that when you're talking about things that are millions of years or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years old, I think uh, the, the desire to want to know exactly how it was is maybe admirable, but I think one has to recognize that uh, there may be some things that we can't untangle. And in fact, this is one of, and so I don't know that whether it, you know, whether there were absolutely no carnivores or not, um, I'm not sure that uh, I know my actual belief on that, or that I think that, I, that we actually have enough evidence so that one could uh, determine what you actually have to believe on that. So I, I, I do get, I find it a little bit interesting that some of the rhetoric in the scientific community seems to go up, the sort of dogmatism seems to go up in complete inverse to the amount of evidence. And so if you're talking about something 500 million years ago, it's just really dogmatic. But, um, you know, I have a hard enough time trying to disentangle what happened 200 years ago when you're actually studying documents of people that you have, let alone trying to piece together 500 million years ago. And by the way, this is the point of people, they may be minority, but I think uh, minorities sometimes become majorities. Philip Skell, member of the National Academy of Sciences, not really a supporter of intelligent design, but very skeptical of the neo-Darwinian story, uh, precisely on the point is because it is the level of evidence for the proposal it is, made is so different from modern experimental science of what you can actually do in, in the lab because it is, neo-Darwinism largely is a historical science. Um, and, and by the way, on neo-Darwinism, uh, actually, if you go and do a literature search of nature and science, uh, there are hundreds of citations of people using, not pejoratively, using Darwinian, neo-Darwinian, uh, as an explanation for the modern theory of evolution. Well, neo, but, neo, Neo-Darwinian is, is an important label. But and, it, just Darwinian. Yeah. Actually, Darwinian and, is yeah. more prevalent than and, Neo-Darwinian. Yeah, and, and Darwinian, too. But, but the phrase Darwinism, that, okay. that's what... If you look for Darwinism, you won't, you won't see very many people referring to... Uh, Darwinian theory. Contemporary Darwinism, evolution yeah. theory, theory, yes. Uh, I mean, because, because there are Darwinian mechanisms and non-Darwinian mechanisms. So that's the way in which... The, the word persists today, but, but nobody thinks of, of contemporary evolutionary theory as Darwinism, except critics uh, who, who can then get mileage in the assault on evolution by assaulting the man Darwin. Splitting hairs between Dar- whether you call it Darwinian or Neo-Darwinian, the idea is w- 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 of, uh, you know, the, well, you're asking questions, so yeah. I'll so get to mine. his turn now? Okay. Oh. Well... I am actually interested in fleshing out because in your book, you, don't, you aren't nearly as explicit about how little of God's intention are really built into creation as, say, Ken Miller is. So would you agree with him that if we replayed the history of life that instead of us, we could be big brain dinosaurs or thinking mollusks? Is that when you say that you agree with Darwin that, uh, that 
that God isn't responsible for the details. Is that does that square with that? I I wouldn't presume to kind of guess exactly what the various things were that God expected to get out of the creation. I think the uh, creation is extraordinarily rich in potential. And when we think about the fact that we've got this amazing biota here on this planet with all the plants and animals, and then we've got all these other planets and other galaxies and possibly other universes and so on. I mean, there's, there's an amazing roster of possibilities in the universe. Uh, I certainly don't think for one second that Homo sapien on this planet is the only thing in all of that pantheon that God has any interest in. Uh, so whether or not this whole show uh, was designed to sort of have us looking the way we are right now, I think it's very uh, hard to make a case that this particular form that we have is exactly what God uh, intended. I think there's reason to suppose that creatures like us were uh, so predictable, given the uh, scenario that was provided, uh, that God uh, anticipated uh, that. But uh, I, I wouldn't presume to guess exactly what God had in mind when creation was inaugurated. But what, I guess you say, creatures like us, meaning... Many creatures that could have a, a, a special type of uh, conscious awareness and relationship to the Creator. So, would you would you um, reject someone who says that human beings reflect God's specific intention? Say, would that you'd be uncomfortable with that language? Well, I, I mean, I'd want to know what specific, I guess, meant there. Okay. I mean, I, I I can't imagine that that God. Uh, just had to have creatures with five fingers and opposable okay. thumbs and so on. And until he got that, he wasn't quite happy because that was his specific okay. intention. What, what about the examples Ken Miller gives of thinking clams? Well, that's sort of an oxymoron because if you're thinking, you're not a clam. Okay. And if you're a clam, you're okay. not thinking. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, I, the, the, he, I mean, he's making a point. We, we don't want to be a literalist on... It's one thing to be a literalist okay. with God's word. It's quite another to be a literalist with Ken Miller's word. So okay. I guess I would say... Okay. I guess I would say that when, when Ken Miller is saying that, he's, he's saying that one could imagine a world where the kind of intelligence that we have is embodied in a clam or in a dinosaur, okay. that the image of God and what God had in mind for our physical structure doesn't require the forms that we okay. see before us. In, you're talking about the fall. Why do you continue to even use the word fall? Isn't that a bit, um, I mean, you were saying calling Darwinism is sort of not accurate. Isn't your use of the word fall, in fact, sort of importing a theology that, in fact, you reject? Because there is no fall. Isn't, I mean, your book, you seem to say we're sinful to begin with. I mean, selfishness drives the evolutionary process. So there wasn't a fall from anything. That's how we were originally developed. So we were sinf- you know the creation was flawed and sinful to begin with. Is that is that your view or anything? Yeah. Yeah, no that's 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 a fair uh, description of the view. Well, I was trying to be uh sort of consistent with the way theological language is used. I mean, there are a great many theologians. I mean, I, I remember reading uh essays by Karl Barth and Emil Brunner kind of arguing about original sin and I mean, they they talk about Adam and Eve and the fall in ways that sound almost fundamentalist, but neither of them accepted Adam and Eve as actual historical characters or the fall as a historical event. But those are theological, that's theological language that has a particular meaning uh, apart from what the English word itself entails. Okay. In your discussion for the evidence for evolution, it struck me that you didn't give any evidence actually for the neo-Darwinian mechanism, even though I know that you accept that. And so I'm wondering, what do you consider the most powerful evidence for the neo-Darwinian mechanism, the unguided mechanism of, of you know, mutation, random mutation and uh, selection, as being the primary, obviously not the exclusive, but the you know, primary innovator and, and driver of uh, evolution? Well, I would say that there is a lot of evidence that's accumulated for uh, you know what we would call microevolution because it's uh, occurred over such a short time span. But we certainly see um, viruses and bacteria responding successfully to toxins and so on, and they they mutate and change to new forms. 
there. And so we, we can see that there's a, a capacity within the genomes of these uh, creatures to adapt to hostile environments and change so that the environments aren't hostile anymore. Uh, and we can see that that happens in uh, eight weeks. But so so that, when that we talk about eight million years, we, there's, that's a lot of time. Okay, so it's sort of extrapolation. It seems to me that no, what you just suggested was evidence that Darwin actually, at Darwin's time, people knew that you could do, in, introduce changes through selective breeding. And so that isn't, um, so it's really the microevolutionary evidence uh, for that. Okay, that's... But, I mean, I guess, I guess it seems to me, though, the, the question is that if you, if you acknowledge that common ancestry is a fact, then you, you've got to come up with a theory to kind of explain this. And so, so there's an, an awful lot of the work done in this controversy is in establishing whether or not you accept common ancestry. And I think the evidence for common ancestry is, is considerable. And I think a lot of the debates that... You, that you pointed to correctly in the evolutionary community are debates about exactly what you're talking about. Okay, we all agree. All the people agree in common ancestry. But it's so hard to imagine exactly how this process works. So we have robust debate about the relative significance of uh, selection at the gene level, at the organism level, at the species level, and so on. But, but in fact, the New Scientist article is talking about a fundamental challenge to universal common ancestry. And in fact, the, the, the graph that you showed, which is this sort of traditional graph of just one universal beginning point, seems to be even a number of evolutionists are beginning to raise issues about that because the phylogenetic trees aren't matching up. Yes, but the, none of the people proposing that are going to say, I am now outside of the community that's exploring okay. evolution. They're all inside the community. This is, a, this is a small question from inside. And there's absolutely nothing that, in, that uh, undermines the central evolutionary tenets if there's two or three or four or more different life forms that begin and then evolve in separate trees. So there's absolutely nothing that is, is undermined by that. I mean, Darwinism... Uh, and contemporary evolutionary theory do not require that everything began from one cell. The evidence seems to point that way, but as you said, there's counter evidence as well because we don't have we don't have fossils of those first cells. So we have to construct that based on very subtle nuances in looking at genomes and so on. But in your book, you seem to suggest universal common ancestry is is the equivalent to the sphericity of the earth, but now you're indicating that it may not be universal. There may be two or three beginnings, and that, that actually there may be a legitimate debate. No, I don't think there's two or three beginnings. And the, and it, okay. I mean, if, if, we're, if you were going to ask the question, what does the scientific community believe about that? You would have to say the scientific community believes that there's single common ancestry. And you can find people on the fringes who would challenge that. But if you're talking about what the scientific community believes, with the paradigm that guides almost all the research that's being done, is that of, of universal common ancestry. Okay. So I mean, we, we, we can find people, geocentrists. I mean, there's geocentrists alive today. I mean, you can always find people on the fringes of any scientific theory. Do you want to oh, give that's, an easy, that's, that's right up there with uh, Ron Numbers saying that, well, we don't credit Holocaust deniers. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, the, the last time I checked, you don't have uh, credential, uh, you know, uh, historians at major universities who are Holocaust deniers or geocentrists. You do have people like Scott Minnick at University of Idaho, Ralph Silke at University of Wisconsin. You have people like Richard Sternberg, who uh, was at the NIH and actually studied the things and is an evolutionary biologist, whereas, whereas Francis Collins is not, and uh, uh, who was one of the early guys to actually break the idea of junk DNA not really being junk, uh, which now is really sort of a, a significant flip-flop sort of among evolutionary biologists. So, Remaining now, we're going to do uh, questions from the audience as well as final statements. But uh, while people are lining up on either side of the room at the wireless microphones, um, and uh, John Bloom is going to conduct questions back and forth. Okay. Since I'm left-handed, we'll start on my left and then alternate back and forth. So, sir. My question is, am I on there? My question is for Dr. Guyberson. Uh, you spend the first eight pages of your book talking about how you rejected uh, creationism because it was absurd. You said the, what you'd formerly defended looked ridiculous. And then you flip the page over to 10 and you say that Christianity had to defend itself early on against claims that it was ridiculous and absurd because of the incarnation and the resurrection. And then you favorably quote Tortullian who says, uh, 
who says we should believe in the divinity precisely because it is absurd. I guess my question is, if you reject creationism because you think it's ridiculous, why wouldn't we reject some of the other tenets of Christianity, such as the incarnation and the resurrection, if those are also deemed absurd? Or if you accept the resurrection because it's absurd, why not accept creationism, which also seems to be taught, at least according to some people in the scriptures? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I would say they're, they're absurd in different ways. Uh, I think the absurdity of the central Christian doctrines of uh, the incarnation and the re- resurrection are, uh, are absurd in the, in the sense that it's this deep mystery of how God could have entered into uh, human form and uh, become incarnate. Uh, and the absurdity of, of creationism becomes the absurdity of looking at data in the natural world that points clearly uh, to the left, but deciding that you're going to conclude that it points to the right uh, instead. I mean, the, the evidence for the earth being very old is, is overwhelming. Uh, and so I, th- I think the, the absurdity there is because there's an alternative view that is simply compelling. So to, to reject something which is compelling, uh, I think, is, uh, is foolishness. But I don't think it's the same kind of foolishness to uh, accept that God became incarnate in Christ. Okay, sir. Good evening. I'd like to just thank uh, both gentlemen for a very uh, thoughtful and stimulating and cordial exchange this evening. Uh, My question is for Dr. Guyberson, and uh, it it really uh, focuses on two passages in the New Testament that argue from analogy. Um, Matthew 24, when uh, Jesus' disciples ask him uh, what will be the sign of his return, he speaks of um, the, the days of Noah and describes the days prior to his return as being like the days prior to the flood. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, just as, so, just as uh, by one man death came into the world, then by one man uh, r- the resurrection. So the, the analogy is that, um, that if, if Jesus' second coming will be occurring in the future as a real event in days similar to historical days that were like those of Noah, and if the resurrection is likened to uh, Adam in the sense that uh, death came through him and resurrection and life and salvation come through Christ, it seems to me that if you call into question the historicity of Adam and Noah, you therefore undermine the trustworthiness of those future promises. How do you respond to that? Uh, well, I, I would say two things. One is, I, I think your question uh, presumes that the uh, biblical characters that you're referring to uh, had the same concept of history that we do. And we know that that's not true. And that's why it's so important to have biblical scholars who take the time to learn the original languages and understand the context so that when somebody says something, we can have a better concept of what, uh, what it means rather than supposing that it would mean the same thing as if they were saying it uh, today. Um, As for the question about uh, historicity, uh, just because you make reference to something uh, from the past uh, doesn't mean that that event has to be a historical event in order for it to be meaningful. I mean, I I could say that that my uncle uh, was a total Scrooge uh, before uh, he became a Christian. But then after he became a Christian, he was just the opposite of Scrooge. And everybody would know what I mean, uh, that I was comparing him to a character in a Dickens novel from the 19th century. Uh, now, just because the character in the Dickens novel is fictional doesn't make my statement meaningless. It's very clear exactly what I mean. Uh, so uh, w- characters can talk about events from the past and make use of insights from those uh, events without automatically turning those events into, uh, into history in the same way that Jesus' parables uh, about the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, and so on don't have to be about actual characters. Okay, this side. My question is also for Dr. Guyberson. And um, 
in your argument in favor of theistic evolution, you explained how it um, can provide solutions to certain theological problems, namely in exonerating God from culpability of the badness of particular designs. And I was wondering how it works that God would be, that the culpability would not be on God for imperfections or inefficiencies in design when either it would mean that in that situation that either God would have been in control of the natural process or not. And if he were in control of that natural process, it would seem that he still is culpable. If he were not in control of that natural process, that seems to um, reduce his um, omnipotence. And I wondered what you would make of that if you... um, if you think that's not a problem or how that figures into theistic evolution, um, solving that theological difficulty. Okay. Uh, that, that's a good question. And I certainly had to kind of romp rather quickly across that, uh, uh, meadow to get everything in, in 30 minutes. Uh, what I would say is this, that if, if you were to pose the question, uh, why did God kill all of those, uh, Jews during the Holocaust? Uh, a a very acceptable response to that would be, well, God didn't kill those Jews. The Nazis killed those Jews. Uh, Well, why was the world such that Nazis could kill Jews? Well, God gave human beings free will, and that's a wonderful gift, and and we're all grateful for it, Uh, but it can be abused, and it was clearly abused in that uh, particular example. So, Free will, in this, in this sense, it, it gets God off the hook to use this language for something that's kind of terrible. So if, if we will give nature some freedom as well, then things which happen in nature are, are not the direct actions of God. I mean, the, the rain which is happening right now. I mean, we, we don't have to believe that, that God is making this rainfall right now so that if two people drown tonight, we have to say, oh, God killed those two people with the rain. Uh, there's a hydrologic cycle. Rain falls, and that's just a part of the way God created the world, uh, not constantly interfering with all of the uh, various trajectories that nature explores on our own. Uh, so I think in uh, in evolutionary history it's the same thing. I mean, we we have new species that have come into existence in the past uh, uh, century. I mean, there's new species of of the AIDS the AIDS virus, for example. Uh, there, I mean, did did God create those new species? I mean, how do we think about those? I mean, they didn't exist a hundred years ago. Now they exist. Uh, 500 years from now, there'll be new species on the planet. I mean, what, what's going on here? How do we talk about the unfolding story of nature, uh, affirming it that somehow this is all the creation of God, but yet brand new things are appearing as we go? So, so somehow we need to relate the ability of nature to toss up novelty on her own to God's creative work as the sustainer and the originator of all that is and somehow get those things together. And I think evolution does that in a way which is very effective and gets God, uh, I mean, off the hook is kind of a flippant expression, but gets God off the hook for some of the things that maybe are unattractive. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yes, thank you, gentlemen, for a very lively discussion. And I also appreciate the, the grace that you're demonstrating your answers and your interaction with each other. Uh, Dr. Guyverson, I'm interested in your view of what happens at these branch, this branching point or these branching points in your evolutionary tree. Uh, and I want to get at it uh, this way. Did God intervene in the evolution of man? And if, it's, if so, at what points? And then how do you know that God didn't intervene at the branching points in your evolutionary tree? Uh, I don't know that God didn't inter- intervene at branching points. Uh, I don't know that God didn't guide the process constantly through a, a steady infusion of, uh, of his intentions. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the relationship is between God's actions and those. Uh, I look at the process and see it as, as rather extraordinary and awesome and I affirm through the eye of faith that this is the creative work of God, but I, I wouldn't want to try to go back and say, well, this mutation was done by God and this one was uh, done by uh, an ultraviolet ray. Uh, 
So I, I can't answer those questions. I, I just affirm that, 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 that this is God's process, and there's a lot of questions that we can't answer about it. So, so the Genesis account, the literal Genesis account, could be true then when it says that God intervened and created the species directly? Uh, well, but it doesn't say that. I mean, the word species doesn't appear anywhere in Genesis. And it doesn't say God created them directly either. I mean, if we, if we want to be faithful to the biblical text, the, the Hebrew language that's used for create there, and, and you can see this a little bit if you look closely at the, uh, even at the English translations, it says, like, let the earth bring forth. So the, the Hebrew concept that's, that's there is, is very much that of a seed. I mean, Augustine and others pointed this out, that like God is, God is saying to the world, let that which is within as potential come out and be realized. So if, if we were to take that at its most literal, God isn't creating those things either. They're, they're sort of coming out of, uh, of the world. So there's, there's very complicated language in Genesis that, that I think is very difficult to connect to our modern scientific pictures to say, well, this refers to a species, this refers to an epoch, this refers to an ecosystem, and, and so on. I, th- I think that's very difficult to do that. Okay, let's see. We've had four questions for Dr. Guyberson. Is there one for Dr. West? Yes, I have one for Dr. West. <laughs> yeah. Four to one here. Yeah. Well, so. well, this question actually could go for either one, but I'll ask okay. Dr. West. Uh, in the account in Genesis, how God created uh, the, the world and the universe, plants, animals, and man, in days, and the day is defined. It says there was evening and there was morning, so the day was defined. So therefore, if you read scripture, uh, Genesis, you can uh, deduct from it that he created everything in six days. And it's all defined each day what he created. Why do you and also others believe that it's not really a day, it could have been undefined time when it was actually defined? Uh, well, I think maybe what I would do is refer you to an excellent commentary on Genesis 1 through 3 by Jack Collins, who is a professor at Covenant Theological Seminary. One of the points that he makes is that uh, day may be used in, in, in a certain way if you just look at Genesis 1. At the beginning of Genesis 2, it talks about the day in which the Lord created, where it's using the same word, but it's basically saying that all the creative activity occurred just in one day. Um, I don't think that that was contradictory, but I, uh, my point is that I think that uh, you do need to look carefully in what, what is the purpose of Genesis 1 and 2? What truths are they trying, you know, is the Bible trying to teach? And I think that uh, insisting that, you know, Genesis 1 is, is trying to give a quasi-scientific account, I just think is... Not self-evident, and, and even in the in the use of the word day um, in, throughout the Bible, but also the different use of the word, saying that all of creation took place in the day that the Lord created, versus then there is this you know sixth day approach. I don't think that's a contradiction, but I do think that that gives a clue to you know maybe we are obsessing um, in the past century, uh, particularly about you know trying to fit Genesis into certain scientific accounts. Again, for me, I would keep going back on, uh, you know, regardless of how you read Genesis, and I guess this is what I'd really like to emphasize, regardless of whether uh, you read Genesis as six literal days, epochs, or that it doesn't deal with that, I don't, the general teaching that, that is com- common to all of those is that, that the Bible is claiming that God envisioned, spoke into existence, and that this was a purposeful activity. He wasn't creating an entity. Yes, he gave human beings free will. That's why we're part of, uh, you know, idea of the image of God. This idea of saying, well, then that means God gave nature, I mean, free will to basically act a part of him, and so that not just the bad things in nature, but nature, the good things, really is the result of this other entity, this demiurge in the Gnostic terminology that God really didn't envision, that's a completely different understanding of God as creator. Now, you can have that, but what you can't say is that that's Christianity, uh, you know, historic Christianity. And this really has nothing to do with fundamentalism or even evangelicalism. You know, the standard teaching of Christians, Protestant, Orthodox, and Catholic, 
has been that there's real propositional content to Christianity, and one of them it takes seriously the notion that God is creator. He envisioned things, and that the creation actually, as originally created, uh, reflected his goodness, um, and that he wasn't creating another entity to create it apart from him. He could have used processes, but when you... And really, the Darwinian approach denies that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Two um, more questions here, uh, just to, so we can end this tonight. So, so um, one either, from this side, one from this uh, side. Either yes, one of sir. you can adjust this. Um, when asked what the uh, evidence for evolution, best evidence, the answer given was um, examples of uh, mutations within microevolution. But it seems to me that uh, using the term, applying the term uh, mutation, it seems to beg the question, why can't those variations uh, represent uh, changes within a spectrum of changes that God designed into those organisms? I mean, two brown dogs giving birth to a black dog, we probably wouldn't think of it as a mutation, but if it, it had two heads, you know, yeah, we'd say that was a mutation. But why is a, a, a moth going from black to white? Why is that a mutation? Why isn't that just a variation that was designed into that organism. Well, I mean, you're, that's a genetics question. I mean, uh, you, yeah, but you, I mean, you, you, yeah, you, I mean, you, you term can, mutation. It kind of begs the question. Maybe yeah, it's not but, a mutation. But you, you, well, I mean, you, you can look at a genome and you can you can say, here's a genome with all the standard uh, variations that are uh, available to the species. Right, there. but prior you were talking about, you, you mentioned, you know, junk DNA. But, but then you but then you so can much DNA that we're not aware of uh, the function. You know, you can't say that these things are genuine mutations when maybe there's DNA or this alleged junk DNA that, you know, that accounts for these changes. Well, so I mean, it's that... not really a mutation. It's really a, a variation that was designed by God. Well, I mean, all I can say is that, I mean, mutation is a, a central and very well-established concept in genetics. I mean, if, you, if you're inclined to challenge that, that would be your choice. But, well, mean, no, no, no. I would say a two-headed dog is a mutation, but but the best example you gave when he asked for the evidence was in microevolution. But those kind of things, I don't think a lot of people would re- recognize as, as a general mutation, you know. In other words, it's not that mutations don't exist. It's that... Uh, you know, like you said earlier, um, evidence is not self-interpreting. You have to interpret that as a mutation. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, uh, but I mean, you, you can do, you can uh, dialogue. I, I, I just like to. I, I think you, you've hit on something, which is that uh, again, the when offered, you know, the evidence for evolution is supposed to be overwhelming, but when you actually look at the evidence that's tried out, it's usually about common ancestry. And in fact, there are lots of evidence-based debates on the various pieces of evidence that lead to common ancestry. But what I want to make is that common ancestry, that the idea that evolution through descent with modification you know, occurred, depends on having a mechanism by which it could have occurred. And so the key point that Darwin, you know, why he was uh, so uh, important, and the reason why it was so problematic, even for many of the science at the time, was he proposed a mechanism, selection acting on these random variations. And yet, the evidence that that is capable, that mechanism is actually capable of creating the grand scale changes that his theory of common ancestry requires is highly arguable, even among a number of evolutionists, which is why you get people like uh, Lynn Margulis, who's not an intelligent design supporter, you know, raising questions about that. And mutations are uh, really a good example, because you have good examples of some beneficial mutations at the biochemical level. But morphological mutations, the things that actually would be required to build new bodily structures, they're almost you know, universally harmful, or in a few cases neutral. And so how you get from that, you know, how that mechanism actually, you know, uh, works out in, you know, finding common ancestry or, or in explaining, you know, how it occurred is a real problem. Yet the examples of you know, what's the most convincing evidence, they don't actually talk about the Darwinian mechanism. The same thing happened when I was on a panel with Ken Miller. And I said, you know, what's the most convincing evidence of evolution? And he gave some evidence for common ancestry. And I said, well, Okay, you've given that. Now give the, how, you know, the evidence of how that uh, natural selection and random mutation can build ma- these major level changes. Not 
the sort of change you can do with breeding. Not the microevolution, but the evidence that can produce the major change in the history of life, which is what Darwin thought he was explaining. You didn't need Darwin to explain minor level changes because they had breeding. I mean, in fact, Darwin cited artificial selection as part of his proof for what natural selection could do. So that really is not the controversy. It's, does this explain the major level changes? And the evidence is, I think, not there. Okay, uh, one question here. Really quick question for Dr. Guyverson. Um, I got the sense as, as I was listening to you speak um, that you don't necessarily take uh, everything in the Bible to be pertinent in the Bible. Um, so I'll, I was wondering what, you would, what your response to Paul would be when he says that all scripture is God-breathed. Uh, I mean, what, would, what do you feel about that? Uh, well, I, th- I think there's a peculiar equation that a lot of Christians make. They, they assume that inspired equals inerrant. And yet we don't interpret inspired that way in any other context except the Bible. If somebody said that uh, this, this poem that he wrote about the uh, situation in Darfur was inspired, uh, we, we don't suppose that it, that automatically makes it inerrant. So, so I don't know why we have to suggest that, that just because God may have inspired writers to put pen to paper and write things down, that 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 means they have to be sort of dictated by God and, and thus have a, a particular type of kind of transcendence that takes them out of their space and time and puts them into uh, sort of eternity so that the statements are always true forever uh, there. I mean, I, I, I'm perfectly fine with the scriptures being inspired, but I, I don't think it follows from that, that that, for instance, when the psalmist says that the earth is fixed and it doesn't move, that somehow he's not really meaning that because he couldn't possibly mean that because that's not true. I mean, the, the psalmist would have believed that the earth didn't move. Everybody who lived in his part of the world would have believed that. And he wrote that. But yet somehow, if we're an inerrantist, we have to say, oh, but he couldn't have meant that because it's not true. So we, we're denying the humanity of the biblical writers when we do that. And, and I, I think we're doing a great disservice to the scriptures. But the word for the breathed is like God actually, his spirit, like he, his words came through the authors. Like he, what the authors wrote were what he wanted them to say. So if there is something in the Bible, like you say, that you're citing from Psalms, wouldn't that mean that that's something that we would have to look at and say, what's the context behind the world being at a fixed point or whatever he's writing about with that? Because it, it seems like you're agreeing with, with the doctrine of salvation and that you know we need a savior and that you know, we're evil by nature, but you're saying... Other stuff isn't necessarily as important in the Bible, and we can kind of shade over that, but in the scriptures, it's pretty clear that everything in the Bible is something that God had a part in, and God put there for a reason. So it seems like you're kind of, to me anyways, I don't know if this is what you're doing, but you're like picking and choosing what you're choosing to believe in the Bible, which is not what we're supposed to do as believers in Christ. Well, that's what everybody always does. I mean, you, you're, you're in violation of a lot of Levitical codes right now. But I'm not under, I'm under grace. I, I'm, I'm freed from those laws. So, while while so, I get closer to God by maybe obeying those laws, I am free under grace. Okay, so you're picking and choosing the New Testament over the Old Testament. What? But the whole point that we have a Savior is so that we're so, freed from the bondage of sin, which is caused by the law. Like, we, we recognize our sin by the law, and that's why we need a Savior, right? Yeah. So then, how am I in violation no. of... I mean, every generation has wrestled with, with how to make the Bible relevant to them. And, I mean, every generation has found different things. I mean, 19th century slave owners thought that uh, the Bible condoned slavery. People oh. that challenged Galileo because the Bible taught geocentricity. Some people think the... Bible teaches that there's no life on other planets. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff that, that's there. And, and I, I don't think it's helpful to somehow say that, that, that no statement in the Bible could possibly contradict a fact of history or a fact of science, even though the writers would have believed that. I mean, I, I, think that, I think that does to the Bible what we have been absolutely unwilling to let people do to Christ, and that is destroy the human component. The, the, the scriptures that you seem to be recommending are not human in any sense at all. They're entirely divine. We just have a bunch of secretaries transcribing words from on high, uh, and, and there's no humanity there. 
So if we, if we can let Jesus be fully human, I think we need to let the Bible be human as well. And I think that means we need to let people speak their own language, have the misunderstandings of their age, talk about the past in the way their generation talked about the past, and so on. And then we do our best to understand that. I mean, Christianity is a historical religion. Things happened not in a timeless nowhere, but in particular places and times. And God chose to do it in that particular way. And we have to wrestle with how hard it is to understand what was going on as a consequence. Was Jesus sinless? Yes. Okay. Well, let me let me finish with two questions of my own here, one for Carl and one for John. Um, I don't know. Did you see the review from uh, Jeff Coyne? Jerry Coyne. Jerry. Coyne. Jerry? Jerry? Yeah. Yes, I forgot to correct that. Jerry. Okay. Because I just he he basically says, and not too politely, that uh, you and Ken Miller are irrational, to use a polite word. And he says, quote, one cannot be coherently religious and scientific at the same time. And then he says that the division between science and anything recognizable as traditional Christianity is simply not resolvable. And, of course, Christianity is the loser. How, how would you answer him on that? Well, I, I mean, I, I've, there's, I did write an answer to him. It's on salon.com. So okay. anybody who wants to read a, a more extended response can go there. I mean, it's not salon.com. It's on uh, John Brockman's Edge. Uh, but, I mean, what, what I would say is Jerry Coyne and, and, all, and all of those new atheists, they, they somehow want to take the, the very best scientific thinking and they want to stand it up against sort of primitive uh, layperson fundamentalism and, and say there's an irreconcilable conflict here. And if somebody comes along who's a sophisticated theologian who, now in, in my view, who might be totally okay with different readings of Genesis and so on, uh, they want to reject that person because they're not faithful to the historic Christian understanding or they don't believe the same thing as all the people in the woods of Alabama, uh, so they're not an authentic Christian. Well, I mean, that's completely unfair. And so, I mean, that's what I think Coyne is doing there, is I think he's mm-hmm. saying that, that primitive, uninformed Christianity is incompatible with science. Okay, I agree. But lots of things that are primitive and uninformed are incompatible with science. Good. Okay. And one for John to close out the evening. Um, you express reservations about Darwin, but how can you not be considered a big brain dinosaur yourself? In terms of where'd you come from? (laughs) So how can you gain respect for your doubts and views in scientific circles? You know, dinosaur, uh, like C.S. Lewis uh, wondered about whether he was a dinosaur. Uh, uh, If I guess I'm a dinosaur, I'm proud of it. Um, (laughs) I guess I'm not... In other words, how do you defend your... How do you get reasonable audience or ears for your... Doubts about Darwin in scientific oh. circles. Well, you know, when I, I got involved in this um, a little over a decade ago, it was after reading a Wall Street Journal article that uh, Steve Meyer wrote about a case, academic freedom case, in fact, involving Professor Dean Kenyon at San Francisco State University, where he was denied the right to teach his introductory biology courses because he came up with the heretical idea that there was evidence for intelligent design in nature. And it got me thinking, and actually Bruce Chapman at that time at Discovery Institute, which had nothing to do with uh, this issue at all, wow, there are credentialed scientists who have significant doubts about Darwin. In fact, here was a guy who was at a state university who was a biologist. And in California universities, where you should be free to say almost anything, you could even probably advocate revolution against the United States government and be okay, um, you were being shut down from actually saying something contrary to Darwin in your biology class. This struck us as wild. And the reason Discovery got involved in it, um, it was sort of a moderately conservative, middle-of-the-road think tank that was actually very bipartisan at that time. Uh, Not at all Later, we sort of get tagged as this very right-wing think tank. It's actually because we decide that the, the, the people, who, the young PhDs in philosophy of science, history of science, biology, who had really thoughtful, uh, evidence-based objections based on you know, recent scientific evidence to Darwin, had a right to be heard. And as I've got, and so you know, I'm a social scientist. I sort of look at this through a different lens. But as I've gotten to know people like Doug Axe, whose PhD is from Caltech and did his research at Cambridge and now has his own lab that we helped fund, 
Um, or Ann Gager, who's a biologist who uh, has her doctorate from the University of Washington, or you know, many people who you don't actually hear about in the big debates. It's not Michael Behe, it's not Bill Dembski, it's many others, and talk to them about their own self-story. It's not this caricature that you get, even, unfortunately, in part of Dr. Guyberson's book, of that it's sort of, you know, they're, they're trying to defend a particular reading of Genesis, and so they skew the evidence or whatever. These are thoughtful people who, in many cases, um, didn't have particular religious objections to common ancestry or other things, who are driven by the evidence, uh, and I don't think that they can be dismissed so easily. And I think they're there, and I think one of the good things of a place like Biola uh, is that you will get the chance to hear some of them. Not just me, I'm a social scientist, but some of the actual scientists and philosophers of science who make things that really don't fit the caricatures of, of much of like, you know, Francis Collins, he has a refutation of intelligent design that I wonder whether he's actually read anything by anyone who's written intelligent design. He's read a couple of refutations by Ken Miller that basically are attacking straw men, and then he popularizes that, and it's, you know, I see almost a complete disconnect. I go out and read the theistic evolutionists. You know, I read Dr. Guyberson's book. I read, uh, I don't, haven't read Jerry Coyne's book yet. He has a new book because it just came out. Uh, but I sometimes wonder whether some of the critics of intelligent design actually read what the people in the intelligent design community are actually writing because they have very thoughtful, very sophisticated uh, objections and that in many cases, really, they have very interesting personal stories that don't fit sort of the meta-narrative that is sort of being told on this issue. And I think if you doubt that, I just, I'll end with, go to Richard Sternberg's website, read his intellectual autobiography, and see if it fits with sort of the meta-narrative that you know, all this is sort of it's fundamentalism versus science, and you know, that's what's driving anyone who's critical. Read his intellectual autobiography. See if you see that. Um, you can go to our website. I think we have an interview that was done with Michael Behe, who talks about how he came to doubt Darwin. Uh, he was a Catholic before. He's a Catholic after. That didn't you know, impact it. Uh, Scott Minnick, someone who I got to know. The light that went off on my head when I talked to him, he liked design because it actually was a much more useful heuristic for what he was already doing in the lab. And the point that he made to me, this was several years ago now, that sort of a light went off on my mind that addresses an issue we didn't really discuss, but it's an issue in Dr. Guyberson's book, is, well, this isn't useful for science. Well, actually, Scott Minnick's point to me, biologist at the University of Idaho, is that the reverse engineering approach that he takes as a microbiologist in the lab of trying to look at biological systems and see how they function is actually much more consonant with the idea that you actually work, your working assumption is this was designed for a purpose and that there aren't extraneous things that if we don't understand you know, what it does that we say, well, it's just the flotsam and jetsam of evolution so we don't need to understand it. That's the science stopper. And what he appreciated about design was actually providing the background heuristic for better explanation of what he was actually doing in the lab. Okay, so. good. Well, thank you for coming. Let's thank our speakers tonight. Yeah. I hope to see many of you here next week as well, so thank you.